Hi everyone, uh, my name is James Harding. Thank you for making the time to come and join us. We know it's, it's getting, if anything, more interesting every day at COP. Um, and so thank you those people who've made time in the room. Thank you everyone who's joining us um, on the New York Times um, website to, to see and to watch this. We have really a gang for you to talk about an issue that for many years didn't really register on the climate agenda and now is something front and center um, which is climate and health, both what the impact of a change in climate is going to mean for all of us, the burden of disease, but also the carbon footprint of the global healthcare system itself. Um, just to let everyone know, uh, Maria has to go at 10.45. So at a moment, uh, either because we're going to confect some big row, Maria, and you're going to stand up and walk out, <laughs> right, which would be more dramatic, or just for reasons of punctuality, because I know you've got an important meeting in the Blue Zone, we're going to do that. Um, but, but I'm really, you know, I know that all of you have a degree of expertise, and if I can make a plug for one small media organisation, if you get the chance, uh, Josh pointed out to me, there is really a great piece in the New York Times uh, yesterday which set out the way in which healthcare has got itself squarely onto the agenda. And Marie, if I can start with you, it's got itself squarely on the agenda, not least because you personally, thinking about the intersection between environment and healthcare and working at the WHO, have done that. You know, you describe it as a public health emergency, the climate crisis. Can you start us off by just telling us a little bit about what you think the impact of climate is going to be on disease? Oof. Thank you, and uh, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, you know, I, I started my career in public health trying to, want to cure diseases, I mean, to treat patients. And then very soon I realized that treating the patients was not enough, you know, if you don't go <coughs> to the source of the disease. And this is exactly where we are now. Climate change is one of those essential sources of the disease. Why? Because to live and to have health, we need access to safe water, access to clean air, food, and shelter. And the four things are now shaped by climate change. So of course our health will be at risk. The disease is which ones? Think about the, what in WHO called the, 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 the killer diseases diarrheal diseases. Well, if you have difficulty to have access to safe water and, and, and sanitation, of course we will have an increase in diarrheal diseases. If you have a transmission uh, through uh, vector, vectors, and those ve vectors will have a fantastic uh, opportunity to better reproduce because the temperature is now higher, we will have more cases of malaria and dengue. Mm -hmm. And in fact, in some places in Asia, we can already anticipate that the, the potential proportion of people at risk of dengue will increase by 35%. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you touch all of that, the production of food, of course you will have a problem with malnutrition as well. If you force people to displace because they, they don't have a, a agricultural production of, or their houses have been destroyed because flooding or, or, or drought, of course these people will lose their little health protection on the, on the health system that they have. So all of those pillars, fundamental pillars of our health will be destroyed at risk or shake at least. And in addition to that, we have the issue of the air pollution. Yeah. And people need to understand that climate change and air pollution are so connected. I mean, the, the, the same causes or most of the same causes, uh, when you burn fossil fuels, these generate uh, pollution. And that pollution, where is descending? In your lungs. Mm -hmm. And it's not staying on your lungs, it goes, to the rest, it goes to the rest of the body. And we have seven million premature deaths every year caused by exposure to air pollution. So, so I'd like to bring in, if I can, Purnima Prabhakaran, who I hope is joining us, I, probably from about, this is the curiosity of Glasgow in this particular week, she's probably actually about 800 meters from us as the crow flies, <laughs> but it takes you about 45 <laughs> minutes to get there, in and out of the blue zone. So I don't know whether Purnima, you're there, because this issue about the, the, the burden of disease and the impact is really going to be felt, as I think you've pointed out, WHO has pointed out, in developing economies, you know, as well as developed economies, but keenly. Is, is it putting you there? I'm going to... Oh! Just getting her up. Oh, you're yes. just getting her up? We can hear you. I'm gonna, you know what, I'm going to keep going and then I'll come back in a second. Josh, can, can, I, can I bring you in? So Josh Carliner 
you know, healthcare without harm thinks about both of these things, doesn't it? You think about both the issues in terms of global footprint, but, but clearly the impacts. There's one thing in the story that the New York Times published, right? It referred to this letter, 47 million, you know, doctors, you know, this, the, the letter worried about the impacts on health and healthcare systems. And this claim that 250,000 additional deaths would be caused as a result of climate change annually. And I couldn't work out whether that's a lot. So it's interesting, and Maria could perhaps speak a little bit more to this, but I think it's a really low number. It's yeah. an old study. Um, it was very, it, it, that, that study was done by WHO 10 years ago, maybe, um, before we knew as much as we know now. And so there are other studies that are coming out now that show that the impact could be much more significant in terms of lives lost. Uh, there was an article in Nature that um, came out just a couple of months ago that found that w if we continue with a business as usual scenario, more than 70 million additional people will die from heat stress alone by the end of the century. So that's, that's huge. And if you combine that with what Maria was talking about, the impacts of air pollution on human health and the fact that more than 7 million people die every year from air pollution, which is driven by fossil fuel combustion, mm. which is the same driver as the climate crisis, then we're talking about a much, much larger number. So I'm going to come, if I might, Miguel, I'm going to come to you in a moment, because I know Reckitt's done this really interesting study on the burden of disease. But Paulima, you're here. Um, uh, and we started, I don't know whether you could hear us, but we started this conversation talking about the, the impact on lives and life expectancies and healthcare systems as a result of climate change rather than, you know, its impact on climate. How, how do you see it? And particularly, will you tell us a little bit about how you're seeing it in India? Thank you, Jake. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, hear you brilliantly. Yes. Sorry, I apologize for the background noise. I'm sitting in the blue zone here. Uh, yeah, so, so it's true. I have, like, Maria laid out, you know, the climate crisis is a health crisis, and in India, uh, we're one of the most vulnerable countries. If you go by the Global Climate Risk Index, we are among the top of the table uh, countries that are going to face the impacts of acute climate events. And when I say the impacts, it's not just the health impacts, which can be both direct as well as indirect. We also face the social and economic costs of the acute uh, climate events. And India is one of those countries, we've got 29 states and union territories, so we are countries within the country with several different climate zones. So at the same time, we see floods in one part of the country, while we see droughts in another part of the country, we see changing patterns of vector-borne diseases, as well as uh, impacts on our agricultural production, which has direct implications for our food security. Mm. And, and uh, yeah, so, uh, so uh, and you, uh, we, uh, we also... And I'm putting, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt you. you uh, Maria sort of helped us think a little bit at the beginning about the, the prevalence of certain diseases and certain illnesses. Are you beginning to see, if you like, the map of illness in India changing as a result of climate in the way in which we're seeing already weather events that you know, we might have thought would be coming in several years or decades' time arriving now? Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, impacts of air pollution, deteriorating air quality, we are seeing it across the board, across the life course, if you will. Uh, so pregnant women exposed to poor air quality face adverse birth outcomes, and we have children who are seeing stunted growth. We have impaired cognitive development. The evidence is just beginning to accumulate over there. And at the other end of the spectrum, adult health, it's not intuitively what we think just respiratory health impacts. We also have the air pollution now uh, documented as one of the top of the table risk factors for cardiovascular diseases, for stroke. So, so there is evidence now that is coming out from India, from studies in India, and uh, changing patterns of vector-borne diseases. But regions of the country that did not see mosquito-borne diseases like malaria, dengue, chikungunya, yeah. like the northeast, the Himalayan regions, are all seeing changing patterns of vector-borne diseases as well. So certainly there is a change happening here. Thank you. Jen, I just wanted to ask you about this. Uh, we're going to come to the, sort of the reform of healthcare systems, but some of the illnesses that we're talking about, they're not what you would expect. They're, they're not illnesses that hit just older, more vulnerable people, you know, impacts on pregnancy, cardiovascular issues, etc. So how, how do you think about this and how much do you worry about the extent to which it's really registered with the public? That's a very good question. I think um, the COVID pandemic has made the importance of 
health so much more evident to people. So I think in the last two years, we've seen uh, more interest in the health impacts of climate change and also people are starting to feel it. Um, to your question about uh, in infectious diseases, we held regional consultations with health professionals around the world um, and uh, health workers in Uganda are um, seeing malaria in the highlands where there was never malaria before and you have populations who hadn't previously been exposed who then get sicker. Um, and I think um, in, um, I'm from British Columbia, um, one of my really good friends had this, has a, uh, had a beautiful baby in January. His name's Neve. Uh, he's one of those incredibly sunny kids. Um, and in addition to the other worries that Rachel, his mom had, you know, first time parent, um, this summer there were days she had to keep him inside because smoke from local wildfires was so bad it wasn't safe for um, babies to be outside. Um, that wildfire burned an entire town in our province to the ground. It doesn't exist anymore. And that, in, that impacted the people who live there and indigenous communities. Um, and there are ways in which we know from talking to health professionals that Rachel and Neve are lucky. They have not been displaced by a flood as has happened in Malawi. Um, they are not facing a drought as is happening in other parts of sub-Saharan Africa. So, and, and I also think um, um, there are so many hidden impacts of uh, heat that we don't yet know about. Yeah. I saw a really interesting study from Kuwait um, that showed that people are more likely to have a heart attack three days after the peak of the heat wave. So if we weren't looking for that, you might miss um, some of those sort of delayed impacts of your body's exposure to extreme conditions that we just aren't used to. So, so can I ask, Miguel, can I ask you to pick up on, this, on the point that Jen Cool's making here, which is the extent to which we actually really understand climate's impact on... Uh, and we'll just go through a bit of the record report, because uh, you're kind enough to send it to me. Um, and thank you, for, by the way, for stepping in at this last moment. It's very good of you. Um, but, but Mia, what, what, did you, what struck you about the findings on actually what's going to happen to us as, if you like, patients? So, look, um, first and foremost, it's a great pleasure to be here. I'm really gra grateful to uh, have the opportunity to join the panel because this, uh, for me, is really a fundamental conversation. And it, it is interesting. I have to say I'm really grateful for the WHO flying the flag for health and the interface between public health and climate change. And it is interesting. We actually haven't had a health day yet. Uh, um, amongst we have not a health day. We have not got a day on health uh, amongst all of the days that we do have. And despite the fact that we've, we've been living through a pandemic and that we do know that the impacts that climate change is going to have on public health are, are immense, both in terms of health impacts on individuals and probably, I think it's fair to say, it'll impact those that are the most disadvantaged hardest and the countries whose healthcare systems are already not resilient hardest as well as the healthcare systems themselves having to start to become, having to adapt themselves and to green the healthcare systems themselves. So we did indeed commission a piece of research, a white paper that we've done with the London School of Tropical Hygiene and Medicine and EcoHealth Alliance. And it just to showcase and give some numbers, put some perspective around that. So what it shows is that are roughly about 13 million deaths each year that are associated with environmental factors, everything from air pollution to infectious disease, burden of things like um, malaria, uh, diarrhea, and so on. And, and we also know that by about 2100... So, so, so those 30 million are not additional, but it, they're environmental yeah, that are, factors. are environmental related deaths now. And we know that that number is going to rise um, because we've, we've heard it from all, uh, all, all our panelists. But I think what is fair to say is that by 2000, roughly 40% of the world is going to be living in areas of extreme heat. Um, and that has at least, I think there's going to be roughly about four and a half million deaths a year that are going to be additional deaths. To that 30 million. That are going to be, that are going to be related to that. The causal links between a, a, a warmer planet, if you like, and, and public so health. So the equivalent of a COVID-19 pandemic in fact, a year. In, in fact, actually, more, more, potentially more deaths, certainly on a par with obesity. So just, I think we need to understand that this has a significant impact. But it then puts the strain on healthcare systems, yeah. both in terms of the, of the healthcare provision, 
but also on the healthcare workers at the front line. Yeah. And that's, I think that's really a critical message. If you think about what's happened in COVID, we've had 115,000 healthcare workers die during COVID. Yeah. My daughter was a healthcare nurse and she's left the medical profession because of the strain and the stress, the mental stress of being a nurse on the front line during COVID. And I suppose one of the things, Miguel, that we've learned in this pandemic is the knock-on, the, the, what people call the shadow, the knock-on effect on other, on the healthcare system to provide care for other illnesses and other diseases. That's the other element of this. I, I'm, I'm only interrupting you because, Marie, Sorry, I want to make sure you get, you get to the meeting that matters uh, even more, I should say, than this one. Um, Marie, talk, just, can we just change tack, if, we, if you like, to the emissions of the healthcare industry itself? Right. It, it, it does not have a small footprint, does it, the healthcare industry? Yeah, and this is uh, very much linked to what you were saying. We realize that this is a major, major crisis. I think all the arguments are there. Uh, the scientific evidence is there. We can put as many figures as we want. This is a health crisis. And therefore, we need to do something about it. And one of the very concrete things that we want to do about it is exactly that. The health sector can contribute, can lead, can provide a positive approach as well. We need to, to demonstrate that this is about action. The health uh, professionals want to be part of the solutions as well. And therefore, the, the uh, innovation and all of this is saying, okay, we will lead by example, we will promote the idea that any national health system will reduce their own contribution. Well, think of the, uh, of the fact that in many countries in South uh, Saharan Africa, they are not only not contributing, but they still need to reach yeah. and have access to electricity. But for those countries that are already contributing, we need to do something. And then WHO has produced the guidance. Now some countries like UK are taking leadership on that, and it's fantastic. We will make sure that as many ministers of health will engage on this, we will reduce our own footprint. We will demonstrate how to do it. It's not an easy thing, but we, we, we will figure out there will be plenty of experiences with uh, healthcare without harm and others. But this will be a contribution that will be very rewarding for the health professionals as well. Because you will see uh, procurement, and I'm talking about the, the, the pharmaceutical companies now, the procurement, the packaging. We need your help as well, the private sector. But Muri, can, can, can I ask, and I appreciate the point about procurement packaging. We don't have someone in the room here who runs a healthcare system. And I just wanted to put to you that some people will say, give me a break. <laughs> we have got a massive backlog of care. We've got rising health inflation. We're all working with governments that are finding that their spending is out of kilter with their tax. And you're adding additional cost here Yes, we've got to deal with this, but you know, the energy sector, the food sector, the transport sector, they can get on and do this. We're going to try and get on and do our day job for the next you know, few years. Why, why put this on healthcare at this incredibly difficult time? No, just to, before I go, maybe I can say that uh, uh, if we sorted out some structural failures, we might not need any money. I mean, we are dedicating still $400 billion to pay subsidies, to give subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. Right. And then the health system yeah. has to pay five trillions on treating the diseases caused by the combustion of those. So if we are a little bit more logical, more strategic, more wise in our thinking, we can, and I'm sure that the health sector, of course, is an additional task, but I'm sure that they will be so rewarded we, we see it already in the health professionals. They are ready to do that. Okay, well, so we will, we will, Marie, we will take that challenge, not <laughs> fundamental redistribution of tax and spend in the economy, <laughs> and as, as you head over to the Blue Zone, make sure we address that. But Josh, so, why don't you come yeah, in response? Yeah, so if I may, so, so first of all, healthcare so makes much. up almost 5% of net global greenhouse gas emissions. And when you tell this to people, either in the health sector or people working on climate change, their usual response is, Oh my gosh, I didn't realize that. That's amazing. That's a huge amount. If healthcare were a country, it would be the fifth largest climate polluter on the planet. Um, and at the same time, I'm looking over here at the sign. It says courage and global equity. We need to figure out how to decarbonize healthcare with courage and at the same time achieving global equity. And so that means meeting global health goals and meeting universal health coverage goals at the same time. So your question about, well, how can that happen when these health systems are so strapped? is a really important one. And I, I guess part of the answer is really also very surprising is that during the pandemic, we saw England's National Health Service commit to net zero emissions. 
we saw major health systems that are big climate polluters in the United States make the same kind of commitment. Just two weeks ago, the state of Kerala in India committed to join Race to Zero, which is the UNFCCC climate champions effort to get non-state actors to um, get to net zero. In the middle of climate exacerbated flooding and landslides. So in the middle of this crisis, the Minister of Health of the state of Kerala came out and said, we're committing to net zero emissions. So what does this mean? I mean, I think part of what this means is that the health sector has woken up to the climate crisis via the pandemic. Right, interesting. And they've seen this is what a multidimensional planetary crisis looks like. Yeah. And they, we know enough now in the health sector to know that that the, the, the climate crisis is going to make COVID pale in comparison. And, and Josh, I imagine that sort of from Healthcare Without Harm's perch, you can actually see what the response globally looks like. Yeah. How uneven is it? How what? Uneven. Is it, I, you're saying Kerala well, sort of stepped in and said, said we, yeah. we get both of these problems. How much are you seeing that around the world? I, so what we're seeing is a growing global movement to take on the climate crisis in the health sector. And I would say there's sort of three big prongs to it, or maybe four. Um, the first one is all of the hospitals and health systems on the ground, the non-state actors that are um, starting to take action, like Kerala, and we've got in the race to zero now, 54 institutions from 21 countries from every continent, representing 14,000 hospitals and health centers committing to net zero. And next to them are others that aren't quite there yet, but are starting to do it. And it's is about, that a tiny proportion? It's, it's the leadership cutting edge. It's a okay, small done. portion, but it is, it's, it's showing the way. And so that's when I say a growing movement, that's a lot more than we had than a couple years ago. Yeah. Um, and, um, and at the same time, what we're gonna see on Tuesday next week is a large number of national government health ministries from some of the poorest countries in the world to some of the richest countries of the world making a commitment to the COP26 health program, which is to build resilience because healthcare is on the front line of the climate crisis and it's got to respond, um, build that preparedness, fundamental health pr principle, and then to implement prevention by decarbonizing. And so there's a, there's a growing movement in that way. And then the third area is that all the people who work for these health systems, the doctors, the nurses, the public health professionals, are realizing that their lives are on the line, that their patients' lives are on the line, their communities' lives are on the line. They're seeing this growing burden of disease um, and, and shifting burden of disease, disease because of climate change. And so they're getting on board, and Jan's organization helped lead this, this sign-on letter that, that, that exemplifies that. Oh, well, John, come to you in a second, but I just want to hear from Pramina Prabhakaran. Pramina, we, 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 we're asking ourselves, really, the extent to which and the pace at which the healthcare industry itself is you know, grasping the net zero challenge. What do you see in terms of pace and scale? Uh, so giving the India perspective again, <coughs> um, I, I think we have a fantastic uh, initiative in the form of a national program on climate change and health, which has uh, been launched by the Ministry of Health in the government of India. So, so that program means that there's a commitment at the highest level in terms of political will, but also a, a, you know, a commitment to start something in terms of a climate response in India. The challenge in India is we have a very diverse health system. So uh, we have a public health system, but we also have a huge network of private health care providers. But thankfully, I think we, we've already made a start in that we've kind of enhanced awareness about this issue of uh, you know, the need for a climate smart healthcare system. So we are doing a lot of work in terms of uh, knowledge, uh, 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 knowledge building, awareness, and actually providing an implementation framework that takes into account both of these pillars of climate smart healthcare, which is one, preparedness and adaptation to deal with the increasing disease burden that we're going to be seeing in India. There's going to be a surge, there's already, it's already happening but also the other pillar of mitigation, or you know, greening the healthcare system. So there's a, a lot of different uh, pillars of action over there, and, and I think we've made a great start. Um, uh, scaling up is gonna be a little bit of a problem. There's always a gap between policies and programs and the actual implementation of the ground. But there is commitment from a number of different states. Josh mentioned the state of Kerala. There's a number of different states that have already started there. They're front runners, exemplars of uh, you know, this action that's required to move us along this uh, 
pathway to decarbonisation. Okay, th thank sorry. you. Can I? Can I? I'm sorry, James. Come for one second. I just yeah. want to just come, come back to Chen Kuo for one second. No, yeah, no, yeah, um, Josh also mentioned some of the campaign work you've done. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit about it? And, and specifically, who are the decision makers you're targeting? That's a very good question. <laughs> um, yeah, so I think because, <laughs> because health professionals are um, seeing the climate crisis in their clinics, um, there was this huge outpouring of uh, over 500 organizations representing 46 million health professionals who are really calling on global leaders, and I think um, global leaders mostly from the most polluting countries, mm -hmm. to be realistically ambitious and keep set targets and take actions that will keep global warming below 1.5 degrees. Um, they're also calling for an end to fossil fuel subsidies. As Maria said, we shouldn't be subsidizing things that are making us sick. And just out of interest, can I ask you, Yeah. does that, does that line of argument work in the sense that a lot of people in the healthcare industry will say, yeah, I totally agree, but I have no capacity to change that or have an impact on that debate? Um, I think I was going to, when you asked about like sort of how we will pay for it, will people be up for it? I think part of the reason people are up for starting to shift, and we've seen incredible leadership from the NHS, is because the healthcare system will have to pay for it later. Right. We will have to pay for it in sick people, in, in increased malaria, in heart attacks, in lost staff who are burned out because of the increased burden of care. And people get that. And I think people do get that. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think, um, there are places in the world where there are already challenges accessing, for example, clean water in, mm -hmm. in hospitals. Um, and so there's also a sort of push of solidarity from doctors and nurses who can see th um, that climate change will make their peers work harder uh, in, in places where healthcare systems will be hit hard by climate change. And so they're also calling for, the letter also calls for financing from wealthy polluting nations mm -hmm. to support the building of resilient mm -hmm. healthcare systems in places um, that may not already have, uh, may not be using energy, but really should be so that they have a functioning clinic when, when people do get sick. So I think, I think health professionals can see the long term, can mm -hmm. see what's coming, mm -hmm. um, and are, are willing to consider um, making the changes that would be would be needed and are and also recognize we can't do it alone. We need really bold and ambitious leadership from from government decision makers. But I, I want to make sure that we have time for some for questions sure. or thoughts. Sorry. So please do kind of just wave at me. It's quite a dark room, so wave vigorously. But Miguel, I cut you off. So look, I, I think it's uh, we've had a lot of conversation about the role of government and the role of the healthcare sector. But within that, you include the private sector. And yeah. I think it's interesting that we don't really talk a lot about the role of the private sector, or at least that we haven't so far. Mm -hmm. If you look at the company I represent, we are effectively a nutrition business, a hygiene business, and a health and well-being business. So we're a consumer-facing business. And so much of what we actually do, the things that we offer people, are in many ways part of that preventative contribution. So we have products that you can use to um, avoid um, uh, uh, mosquitoes. Uh, you know, we have mosquito repellents. We have uh, Dettol, which I hope many of you have been using if you are in the blue zone or around in, <laughs> yes, doing the blue zone, to, I hope you're doing it. That's about keeping you hygienically safe. That's actually sp stopping the spread of diarrhea. And COVID. Um, there are products that we sell which are enabling people to improve basic nutrition, mm -hmm. malnutrition. These are things that you know, we can make a contribution in terms of addressing the burden of disease. But I think there's a role that we can also play in working with the healthcare systems themselves to pay a part in that conversation about how can you not only build a more resilient and adaptive healthcare system, but actually make a net positive contribution. Because actually you're asking a lot, you know, you're saying to governments, you need to do something about air pollution, you need to do something about improving the water quality. But naturally, people will say, but what are you doing yourselves? So what is it you can do in the developed world primarily, but in the healthcare systems that we have to improve the way in which those healthcare systems green themselves I, I, and I build that resilience? But can, can I just ask you something, Miguel, about that? So 
I, I wonder whether we've learned something about ourselves that, that we all see this problem. Josh, I take your point about dealing with this issue with courage and global equity and yours, Jen, about we need to see leadership. But look at each of us, right? Most of us here, I think probably everyone here, here got up this morning and did a lateral flow test, right? And just look at the packaging, right, of a lateral flow mm -hmm. test, right? And look at what that says about us, which is, yes, yes, we get, we get climate, but it, right in front of us, we worry about COVID. And I just wonder mm -hmm. whether or not we're being realistic about the way in which we prioritize issues around health. Mm -hmm. But James, I, look, I, I think, we were saying earlier, there are 50% of the hospitals in the world that don't even have access to clean water. Right. Or basic hygiene and sanitation. So 50%. So the issue there is that this is going to get much worse. And actually, there's an underinvestment in healthcare provision in many parts of the developing world today. And if we then know that things are, that the burden of disease is only going to increase, then the challenge is how do you meet the, how do you address that and build that in, which is where financing, it's where collaboration with government, and, and governments including this within their national plans mm -hmm. is going to be an essential component of how we address adaptation to climate, because that's what we're really talking about, as well as mitigation. Mm -hmm. And if I may say, the second comment I would make is that you're right. When we look at healthcare provision, we don't really question, you know, single use, uh, plastics or things like that in a hospital environment because the health care system is designed essentially to keep the patients alive, keep them well. Mm -hmm. And so these things that we don't necessarily put the, the, the focus on are actually part of the problem. So we have to figure out those solutions. But we need to give people the tools and we need to not only inspire people, which is what we're talking about here, but also we need to help them understand what it is that they can do. What are the sorts of things that they can be doing? And that's, I think, there is a role for us in that, I think, from a private sector perspective. Josh? So you brought up a really important point. Um, COVID waste is healthcare waste, and healthcare waste is um, a huge problem in and of itself in terms of impacting the health and well-being of, of people all around the world, especially in low- and min middle-income countries where there isn't um, necessarily, there aren't good systems put in place to sustainably manage that waste. But it also has to do with what we produce and the packaging we produce, the materials we produce, how we produce them, whether it's um, uh, lateral flow tests or PPE or pharmaceuticals or hygienic products. Um, the healthcare supply chain is 70% of healthcare's emissions. And so a big part of decarbonizing healthcare needs to be the supply chain. And how's that going to happen? It's going to happen with um, companies like Novartis and Reckitt taking responsibility. It's also going to happen because healthcare providers, both the, the doctors that are prescribing medicines, doctors that are, and nurses, doctors and nurses that are using anesthetic gases, um, and those who are in the purchasing departments of hospitals and the leadership of healthcare systems starts demanding sustainable, low carbon or zero emissions products. Um, and so that, is starting to happen. We're seeing that in here in the UK, where the NHS has said by um, three years from now, any contract over five million pounds has to have come from a provider that has a net zero plan. Mm -hmm. So that's a good start. We're seeing other hospitals and health systems in the US and in developing countries start to implement sustainable procurement. So the demand side is super important. And then we have to figure out how to do this in the context of in a tremendously unequal world where, again, people have emphasized on this panel, a lot of people don't have access to adequate health care. There's health, health facilities that don't have energy. Um, but what we think is that the sustainable solutions to bring health to people who don't have access it, to it are very similar to the, the solutions that we need to have, have happen in, in large developed countries and that they fall into certain categories like energy, transportation, food, pharmaceuticals, um, and, and, um, and other key areas where healthcare consumes resources. So if you look at those categories, the solution may look really different in India, where Purnima sits, um, and it lo will look different in Delhi or Mumbai than it will in, in a rural area in India even, than it might look in, um, in the UK or the United States or, or Japan. Can I, I'm aware that we're just running out of time, so I'm gonna ask each of you, if you can, to Imagine a healthcare day at COP in <laughs> Egypt. 
and what that healthcare day puts as number one on the agenda. So the sort of methane equivalent for the healthcare sector. <laughs> Um, and I'm going to do something for an affair. I'm going to ask Miguel, you first. Oh, that's really unfair. <laughs> I don't feel like I've it. Actually, I'm just smiling because there was a mosquito flying around here, and I'm thinking Glasgow mosquito climate change. <laughs> Perfect. Uh, I don't know how we got there, but... Um, um, so I think, first and foremost, the fact we have a healthcare day in Egypt would be success in itself. Mm. Secondly, I don't think that um, there is a single button to push. I mean, when you look at what we've been announcing here, the sectoral agreements that we've been announcing here, they're not single silver bullet solutions, and they will have to be different solutions for different countries. Um, I clearly think there'll be a financing part of that conversation. Right. So how do we make sure that some of that 100 billion finds its way into some of the, of the developing countries healthcare infrastructure investments. So I'd like to see that. Okay. Um, Pranima, will you, what, 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 would you ha what would happen in the, in the healthcare day other than that it happens? Um, so, so I just want to take a step back and say when we were at the last COP, which happened in Madrid in 2019, a lot of us, I think WHO Healthcare with us, all of us came away saying that we're going to make the next COP the health COP. It didn't really happen. We do have a day where there is a focus on health, but I'm certain in Egypt that we're going to make it happen. And I think when that happens, it's going to be, I think, a focus on healthcare that's going to be uh, you know, available, accessible, affordable, but also green. You know, making universal healthcare access green. So that kind of completely brings together all the different components that we're going to be talking about, really talking about reimagining healthcare. We had a session yesterday where we talked about this a lot. And I think one big focus would be also on bringing the young healthcare professionals with us. They're already a very important voice in this, in this uh, initiative. And I think uh, we have a big movement building that's happening at the uh, health day at the next COP is a certainty. Okay, Jen Cool, when you bring down the gavel on the health day <laughs> next time, what's it gonna, what will you have achieved? Um, I think uh, it would include um, a focus on equity, having health professionals from some of those most impacted nations uh, present and able to participate, young health professionals who are real leaders. Um, I was thinking with your previous question about, um, you know, lateral flow tests. Um, Einstein was using a, a le an oil lamp and a candle when he invented the light bulb. Mm -hmm. We don't have to be, you know, we don't have to have the technology we need in order to aspire to have it. Um, and I think COVID was a real example of showing us we could make big changes fast to protect health. We all learned how to do lateral flow tests and to mask up to protect other people. Yeah. And so I think the health day would be really a day of increased ambition, understanding that we need fast action to protect our health as we did so, so well in this pandemic. I feel another letter coming on. <laughs> um, <laughs> Josh Carlin, give us your last, the, the last word on this. Well, I'll be a little bit, I'm tempted to be a little contrarian and say every day should be the health day. <laughs> and we should see it integrated across all these different sectoral days. But if there, and if there is a health day in addition to that, I'm with Jen. It should focus on aligning global health equity and global health goals with global climate goals. And the, that should be the overarching theme because these are two huge issues that we see coming together and we need to take action on together. Josh, thank you very much. I hope you'll agree with me that we did something which is in the spirit of this climate hub, took a really amazing piece of reporting yesterday on what's really happening in the intersection between climate and healthcare in the New York Times and then held a session in the New York Times climate hub and then brought it to life. So for, for that, thank you, Jen, thank you, Josh, thank you, Miguel, thank you, Pramina, and thank you also to Maria, who had to go. Uh, thanks to the Climate Hub for hosting this conversation. Uh, we'll see you all uh, for the next conversation, which starts moments from now. Thanks, everyone. Thank